committee. I was going to take you through the draft 1.2 of your committee amendment. Um, we went through this bill last week and there were a couple of tweaks that needed to be made to make sure that it reflected the intent of the sponsors. Um, yep. So that those changes are made in this draft. Um, and I have a just a little summary document I can give you as well if that's helpful. Great. A little section by section. Um, so we can just go through this pretty quickly, I think. And if you have some, I'll put them on the desk. Yeah, I have two more. And one for Peggy. Oops. Yeah, I'll give that to her. Sure Don't post it yet. Don't post it yet. Yeah. No, no problem. I'll post it. You let me know. <coughs> okay. Um, so section one, <clears throat> again, this is the penalties for first and second degree murder statute. And um, the changes here are pretty... Um, I think they're pretty minimal. Um, so again, just as a reminder, this is the statute that sets out the um, punishment for murder in the first degree, um, and it changes it so that it removes that possibility of imposing life without the possibility of parole. So first degree murder is a minimum term of 35 years, maximum term of life imprisonment, and second degree murder is a minimum term of 20 years, maximum term of life imprisonment. <clears throat> And then the change down at the very bottom of the page, that's just um, putting in the effective date of that act that we discussed <coughs> last week, Act 119 from 2006, um, which was responsive to the provost's decision. And some of that is summarized in, in the document that I gave you. Um, if you turn to page two, su subsections B and C are um, apply to homicides that were committed prior to that Act 119 um, that was enacted on May 1st of 2006. So those set forth a different sentencing uh, scheme. And the difference is that, they, is that there is a possibility of a minimum term that's below the presumptive minimum that's set out in, in what's currently subsection A, that 35 years presumptive minimum for first degree, 20, 20 years presumptive minimum for second degree. So the only change that's made to these two subsections is that, it, again, it removes that um, possibility that the judge can impose life without parole um, on anybody who committed a murder prior to 2006. <coughs> change in subsection G at the bottom of the page. I do the same thing. I just take out, this is just a really a sort of a clerical thing, take out effective date of this act and put in the actual date. That pretty clear about section one? Mm -hmm. Okay. So section two, this is the aggravated murder statute. Um, and if you turn to page four, it um, amends the statute, strikes some language to provide that a person who's sentenced for aggravated murder um, shall not be eligible for parole. It strikes that language so that a person who is convicted of aggravated murder um, could not be subject to a life without parole sentence. <coughs> Section three is the consecutive sentences statute. Remember, this is the section that provides that a person who um, commits crimes um, for which they are sentenced to multiple periods of incarceration um, when they're under 26 years old has, has to serve those sentences concurrently. So a judge can't sentence, um, sentence a person to consecutive sentences uh, if they were under 26 when they committed the crimes. It's the age at which they're trying not to make. Right, right. So no changes there. And then no changes to the next two sections, section four. This is the statute that prohibits a life without parole sentence for juveniles. Um, it amends that statute to make it apply for everybody. We're on page seven now. Okay, I'm sorry. Can you read the page? I'm still trying to wrap my head around a sentence on it. Okay. Pages four and five. Okay. Persons sentenced under this section shall not be eligible for work release or non custodial furlough except when serious medical services make custodial furlough inappropriate. Right, so if custodial furlough is inappropriate, then a person may be eligible for non custodial furlough. And I'm not sure what sort of medical um, services might make custodial furlough. I'm reading that word backwards, the word inappropriate. I'm thinking it should be appropriate, but 
I think it's, it's <laughs> presuming that if custodial furlough is inappropriate, then non-custodial furlough would be appropriate. Oh, I just thought that. Okay. Yeah. I think it's the person who is so incapacitated that they are Maybe. Well, I, I agree with you, Dick. That's, that's the intent. But I'm, I'm yeah. looking at the language thinking, is it backwards of what it should be? Uh, Maybe. Um, except when serious medical services make custodial furlough inappropriate. So custodial furlough, we're using that term as somebody who's incarcerated. And then, what is custodial for a long Yeah, time. I'm going to have to go and refresh my memory about custodial versus non-custodial. My understanding is that they, if they're, they're still in the um, custody of the Department of Corrections when they're on custodial furlough, yeah. and if they're in non-custodial furlough, they have been released and they're no longer in the custody of the Department of Corrections, but they are still under the supervision in the community. They're under community supervision <coughs> status as opposed to incarcerative status. So I think not. I think custodial furlough is you you get sent out um, <coughs> for your medical services. Yep. Um. <coughs> is everybody going to understand that? There, it's what defined it's elsewhere. Well, this is my. I, <coughs> I, oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. Right. I I I'll, I'll double check those um, definitions and get back to the committee on that. Yeah, please. If you want to just continue through these. Sure. So the, the, the final two sections, um, section five, the purposes <coughs> section, no changes to the um, draft is introduced, the bill is introduced. This is the purposes of the Department of Corrections, and it just um, amends that purpose language on page eight, line seven, to ensure that the department provides programming for a return to the community for all incarcerated offenders because it presumes that life without parole is no longer an option. And then lastly, the effective date. No change there. Yeah, striking section line number three, right? Right. Um, and I, I may be wrong about this. Does life without parole carry an automatic appeal? I would then so. would, would would eliminating life without parole also eliminate the well yeah Marsha? No, it wouldn't because the automatic appeal applies to any life sentence, whether it's with or without parole. Okay. Uh, any life sentence gets an automatic appeal. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, I thought it would just eliminate one more court process. Maybe we should and, and not no. allow them to have an appeal? No, they could have an appeal, but, but it's it not would automatic. automatic. Appeal. Oh, I see. Honestly, it wouldn't make that much of a difference because as a matter of practice, any time a life sentence is imposed, um, the defense attorney files a notice of appeal anyway. Yeah, I would. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, are, are we taking more testimony on this? Or is yeah, right this, now. I, I, I'm not asking you to vote yet. No, I just could because I was going to say I had a conversation um, the other day with someone who said uh, that there are very few people in Vermont on life without a I think it's 15. Well, which, at one point it was 19. Somebody said last week it was 16. But it's somewhere around there. Last week we had 12. Yeah, but it's somewhere no, around keep, there. Where do they go? How'd they, they die? Part of the problem is POC has no idea. I've asked for the list of people. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not joking. I've asked for the list of people on life without parole numerous times. And I get a different list every time. Skyler's asked for a list. He gets a different list than I do. And we can both find people who are on life without parole who don't show up on DOC's list and mm -hmm. go back and find where they were sentenced. That, that was Marshall <laughs> Paul criticizing the Department of Corrections list. I don't understand that. I mean, I understand what you said. <coughs> no, I, I, I would I guess it's somewhere between 12 and 20. 
and evidently they don't know. So anyway, whatever the number is, this person's um, position was that it's because we have a relatively low number, it seems that the system is working and that those people who, who should never be paroled are, are only there, that the system itself is working and that um, and the bill is unnecessary. And the bill is unnecessary. That, it, it just that the, a point of view. Yeah, no, I just I, I found that very interesting because we <coughs> have been cutting our our prison population and so the people who are really need to be there. Yeah, and her point was that um, if we do this there's for victims in particular there's always the um, fear that that person will will be paroled. So anyway, I just threw that out. Um, I see she's not here to testify, but. <coughs> but I, I mean, like anything, you're going to have opposition. Oh, I, oh, I know that. I just, I hadn't thought of that before, that maybe the system. I, mean, I, I, I can see there's good, it, it's a, you know, it's something that I obviously support. I would introduce the yeah. bill. Or yeah. Punch. Probably been more of the house funds in the bill. I, I, really, I, yeah. I fully understand people's concern about some of the most violent offenders of actually being paroled. But on the other hand, uh, yeah, <clears throat> I just thought I'd throw it out. So what you're saying is we should bring back the death penalty. That's what some people. That was a vote, Marshall. That's David and David, I mean James, stop celebrating. What some people have said, if you don't have life without parole, you need to have the death penalty. Some people well, have said that. Yeah, I, I believe, <laughs> and, and I think research research research, research, but I believe there's still the death penalty on the books in Vermont. It just happens to be unconstitutional. Yeah. I don't believe it's ever been repealed. But it is unconstitutional? Yeah. I'm That's my understanding. Yeah, I'll check. Are you on this committee where there's Edwin Grimm, a really, really old guy, and he has testified on the death penalty? Yeah, yeah. 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 Y
One of them um, was very supportive of the bill um, and actually wanted to go a little bit further so that um, she could reevaluate sentences of all people serving either life sentences or de facto life sentences. Um, uh, a few of the state's attorneys kind of took your thinking but took it the other way that it's so rare and the possibility of parole for those crimes is so low that do we really need it? Um, um, however, the vast majority of the state's attorneys, um, particularly the ones that have been involved in the prosecution of these cases and have seen how the trauma has kind of rippled through their community, um, were very reluctant to supporting this, um, specifically as it applies to aggravated murder. You know, there's a life without possibility of parole for first and second degree murder, but the real concern is for aggravated murder. Um, you know, these are crimes that are usually so atrocious that you know they damage the fabric of society. They they make well-intentioned people think twice about getting into public service um, or helping a fellow citizen. Um, I think you know they the pros and cons of this issue are on an academic level are pretty well established. Um, life without parole provides a more humane alternative to capital punishment to the death sentence, um, while still fit, fitting most people's inherent sense of justice. Um, it provides finality and closure for the victim's families um, without having to re-traumatize them through the parole process. On that issue, I would just say that Laura Sobel's father reached out to me last night. We had a long conversation. He told me to bring up her name he told me to bring up how his feelings on this. I'm not going to do that, other than to say that he thought that this, the House version of this bill had passed, and that's why it was in the Senate, and he was legitimately, I mean, that's the level of trauma that he's still facing. It's just that even the passage of the possibility of this is, of one chamber has, has got him, well. Uh, life without parole removes the, removes the most heinous criminals from society, prevents them from reoffending. Um, and it serves, it can serve as a general deterrent for other people thinking about committing similar crimes. I know that some people say that the certainty of punishment and not the consequences are what actually serves as a deterrent. Um, I would say there's a long section in the Sobel opinion um, about deterrence and the ripple effect this has had. Um, and on DCF workers and people interacting with DCF. One might argue, and argue on the other side that there's more likelihood that these events, rather than being a deterrent, end up with copycats. And if you look at the mass murders around the country, firearms, um, they appear to have a certain, rather than being a deterrent, people want their 15 minutes of pain. Yeah. Willing to go out and blaze the glory, but, you know. So I really, I, I, I've always questioned deterrence. Yeah. Um, but I think people who commit heinous crimes deserve strong punishment. But I'm not sure it deters somebody else who's in that moment of either psychologically so distraught that they're they're not thinking about what happens to them. I'm going to do a life in jail when they yeah. commit the act. Or somebody is so furious and so enraged by a partner in a domestic situation that they would murder that partner. I don't think they're thinking about what the consequences yeah. are. They're just so over-consumed by that rage. <coughs> and then, Can I ask a yeah. question? Yeah. I hate to... Anyway, I, I'm just, uh, deterrence is one of the things that's bothered me my entire adult life working with kids. Um, thinking that sending kids away is going to deter them from future behavior. Uh, if I can chip in on that particular conversation after 36, almost 37 years of representing criminal defendants, and I don't know about you, Marshall, but I've never run into one of them who was thinking about, gee, is this going to result in X? That deterrence just does not register on the radar screen. I, I recognize that. I You know, they're in... But the Laura Sobel opinion, the judge quoted her as saying, killing Laura was worth going to jail for life. 
So you can see that while it didn't ultimately deter her, there was a balancing of kind of the, her actions and the consequences. Yeah. So while he's on the phone, I'm gonna, <laughs> yeah. um, I hate to ask this again, but can we get a definition of what, oh, of aggravated cool. first degree and second degree? Okay. Is that in here? Is that in the bill? Mm -hmm. okay. Aggravated and first degree and we'll the, 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 the factors for what we'll makes it. Oh, here it is, aggravated defined. Right. Then. Okay, Go thank ahead. you. I guess I hadn't, even though I was a co-sponsor, I guess <laughs> it depends. Thank you. So aggravated is on page six. Okay, yeah. so anyway, I interrupted your I'm, testimony. Yeah. So Thank you. There's less angst about um, first and second, but the aggravated murder. I mean, it's, it, this bill essentially renders aggravated murder superfluous. It, it treats it the exact same way. So, so the, is that a suggestion that we consider taking away life without parole for first and second degree? That would be in line with the vast majority of the state's attorneys. We could, we could make that amendment and then have a discussion about it. If you wanted to make that suggestion. I, I would make that suggestion on behalf of the state's attorneys. Okay. I think yeah. so. We yeah. So I think, you know, life without parole, a sentencing judge is, should, in every case, consider rehabilitation. You know, life without parole seemingly forecloses rehabilitation. Um, and it, it, there is, a, it's not that it forecloses rehabilitation, it just says that the magnitude of this crime, that the punishment should extend beyond the rehabilitation of the individual. When we talk about life without parole, which is worse, the death penalty or the life without parole, I'm always struck by cases like Aaron Hernandez. He obviously, to him, life without parole was worse than a death penalty, so he gave himself the death penalty and gave him the opportunity. Yeah. For, for some people, I mean, for other people who wind up doing good works in prison and have a whole yeah. community there. So it isn't, certainly not in those cases. I'm just commenting else. Death is not better. I'm just commenting that, you know. For some people, I. Which is more. They can probably kill themselves on the range of Sadly. Yeah. Um, I mean, even some of our most rehabilitation-centric judges in Vermont yeah. have determined that life without parole was appropriate in the most yeah. rare, egregious circumstances. Um, you know, it's just one of those sentences that you hope you never have to use. Um, but again. Um, <clears throat> some some courts have found it appropriate in, in the very rare circumstances. Um, I'm going to move on to the consecutive sentences for people under 25. <coughs> yep. um, from a policy standpoint, the state's attorneys raised, all, almost all of them raised the kind of similar issue that there's, it creates a negative incentive for them or de-incentivizes disincentivize, pleading down a felony to a misdemeanor in certain situations. You know, if you have someone, the example, a 24-year-old charged with aggravated assault with a weapon, it's a felony punishable up to 15 years, and they have a misdemeanor stalking charge as well. You know, the, the state's attorney is looking for, a, you know, one-year incarcerative term plus three years supervision. You can get that pretty easily by pleading uh, two, to two misdemeanors, you can, but under this law, the maximum term of that sentence would be two years. I probably shouldn't give away my secrets, but that, that all was developed, and Bryn and I talked about it. Okay. We talked with Skyler about it before I introduced the bill, and one of the decisions was, what do you do about that if it's consecutive? Because it basically, if you do two 50-year to life yeah. without parole, or 25 to life, and you're 50 years old, it's, just, it's essentially life. Yeah. So the idea was just kind of a compromise. We'll cut it off at 25 because of the information about those who are under 25, brain development, et cetera, et cetera. So it, you know, it's, it's not critical, but 
if you're if it was one of the problems with as I saw it with with efforts in other states to do life without parole yeah. you don't deal with consecutive yeah because you essentially if there's the de, de facto life without parole. It is de facto yeah. Life yeah. parole. And and I and I am very much aware of the emerging adult brain science yeah. and, and I agree with that. That was it's, what the, that's the it, genesis of that. That may be something it's for the the kind of lesser felonies, yeah. the ones that aren't gonna right. that a prosecutor might want to plead down to a misdemeanor. But if he can't stack those two misdemeanors, then he's not gonna get sufficient he or she won't get sufficient supervision. Um, on the tail end, and it's not just about incarceration. It's about uh, you know it can be pre-approved furlough with a you know programming at the tail end well, and supervision. Hopefully, all that changes with justice for the best. Sure. That was the main concern about the um, consecutive sentence piece, and I you know again I don't think that state attorneys are talking about the, the long, stacking the longer term sentences. It's really those crimes that could be pled down to a misdemeanor. Um, Do you take a, a poll of state's attorney to see if the majority would support a bill that had um, the uh, provision that aggravated murder is not included? Yeah, I absolutely would. And I can tell you from the nature of our conversations already, I think that's where the vast majority of them are, um, with the exception of people that would like the bill to go further. Can I ask, I know there's a relatively low number of people with life without parole sentences in Vermont. Of those, how many do we know? How many were prosecuted on an aggravated? Uh, we don't even know how many apparently are on life without parole. We just heard that every time they ask, you get a different number. Oh, because uh, didn't we get the number in uh, Justice Home? Yeah, we, but like evidently that's not the same number that David Shure's gotten, that Marshall, Marshall Paul's gotten, that Scott got. They all get different numbers. So they've all, they're all, they're all different numbers. Yeah. All around. They're all 20. relatively close. Yeah. There's no more than 20, no less than 10, I would say. I have the li the most recent list from DOC right now, uh, and apparently it might not be accurate, but <laughs> but that's what I asked for last week. So is am I reading this right, that only one is aggravated? Well, I know that this this one is aggravated. Oh, it doesn't. It doesn't say it though. So again, the the data might the the coding system might not be totally. Yeah. One of the first yeah. things they said in the Justice for Investment was our data collection is horrible. Well, come to education, it's the exact same thing. Yeah, law enforcement, it's yeah. the same. Everywhere. It's, it's anyway. Sorry. Oh, that's the that's the end of my testimony on this. So, um, just not to keep it too long, and maybe you don't know it exactly, but if, as the chair suggested, we carved out aggravated, it seems like we would be dealing with a very small system, yeah. like on the order of less than five, maybe. I, I think so, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But we still have the most kind of crime. Just the most kind of crime. Yeah. The elderly, the life of the poor. Yeah. Bryn's going to go over the aggravated do you have language about the yeah. change language about the consecutive? I can propose something. I just would want to run it through the state's terms yeah. first. Yeah. Any other questions? Judge Grierson, two days in a row. We're back a thousand. See, when you come here, we actually bring you up to the table as opposed to the house. Well, they brought me here. Oh, did they? Yeah, I was here for two hours in the witness chair <laughs> yesterday, so they made up for. You said they kept uh, putting you out. Good morning. Uh, for the record, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge. Um, testifying to S261, I have the uh, draft uh, dated uh, 512 yesterday. Um, and I did, um, obviously, this is a, a significant policy. A decision for this committee and for legislature and the court does not uh, take a position uh, in, in support of or in opposition to uh, to the policy um, I did um, run it by the judges just to get comments or questions and uh, some of the questions they had uh, were have been addressed in this most recent draft um, we received an earlier draft yesterday um, and so they've been addressed the the only two comments um, 
I would have or, or what has already been discussed this morning. One, um, the aggravated murder, uh, if, if you proceeded on this draft, would not have a minimum um, uh, sentence in it. Um, and on the question of uh, running sentences concurrently, uh, the, the question they raised with me was, does that mean if there is a conviction at age 19 or 20 and a, an offense four or five years later, still under 25, does this bill mean that despite any gap in time that any sentence incurred at any time under 25 would be concurrent? So again, uh, not taking a position on it, but just raising the, the question. Okay. And, and How frequently do judges do, do, do people do consecutive sentences? I don't think you can. Really I don't know that it's frequent. I mean, I mean, keep in mind, remember the other number that came out in Justice Reinvestment, that 99% of cases are resolved through plea. So when those pleas come in, part of the agreement is always concurrent or consecutive, or maybe some of them are consecutive to each other and the rest are concurrent. Um, and so I think to the extent that a court might um, interfere or object or uh, alter a, a, an agreement, I don't know that it comes into that area of concurrent or consecutive. Um, mm, I, it's very, it's very um, case specific. Um, it a lot depends on the, the, the types of offenses. Maybe one uh, occurred, the case has been pending for a long time and, and one offense occurred uh, much later. Um, in other words, they're not close in time. Uh, so there are any number of reasons why a court might in impose a consecutive versus concurrent. But um, usually when cases are resolved all at one time, all one incident, there may be multiple counts, they're going to be run concurrent. Uh, is, is there a difference in the um, 14 states' attorneys in whether they um, do murder one, murder two, or aggravated? I mean, I. I just, because I know the, some of the names on there, and I was just curious. There was only one aggravated murder on there, but I, that said it, and I wondered why that one was and some of the others weren't. I think, um, I think Pepper said it best. Uh, the state's attorneys are not a monolith, and so you have oh, yeah. 14 uh, okay. different views on how they approach the charging decision. And, yeah. and the negotiating yeah. position, okay. so it's, um, it, it varies. It does vary. No yeah, question. I um, and I, unless there are other questions, I, those were the no. comments that so I had. We're going to ask you sometime in the next few days about the bill S-275. So. Um, Peggy mentioned it, and I'll take a look at it. I, 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 think, would. I think the main question is, is it something that is overstepping the bounds of the legislature? I can give you a preview that my opinion is yes, <laughs> um, but, 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 I, but I will say um, check it out. Yes, but but I will. That's the question. I, I'll be prepared to tell you why I think so because a lot of what's in there, um, are, I can explain better what our training is uh, yeah. when folks come on board, so right. that you'll understand why I don't think it's yeah, I necessary. Think it came out of judicial retention of Senator Nichols, the chair of that committee, so I think she has some experience. We have a diverse group on judicial retention. Just like Yes, we do. <laughs> Not a monolith. Not a monolith. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. <laughs> Marsh, uh, David, sure. Um, David Chair for the Attorney General's Office. Uh, the Attorney General does support the elimination of uh, life sentences without parole, looking prospectively. Um, we've already, the committee's already discussed some of the primary issues in play here, and I do think that the data is pretty clear that the deterrence argument isn't a strong one with respect to um, the effectiveness of sentencing, what, what, are, what are we doing sentencing for, especially for these most serious crimes? Deterrence doesn't seem to um, have much practical effect in the world. That being said, punishment is a valid and necessary aspect of our criminal justice system. Um, and 
I think the concept here and the idea here is that there is still severely punitive sentences that are available for these most serious crimes and that that will remain. But we also have to look at the back end for people who have been in for years and years, maybe decades and decades, does it still make sense for an individual who may not be a danger to society at all anymore, who may be quite elderly and frail, does it make sense, is it, is it just to keep them in? Does it make sense financially to keep them in? It seems like a reasonable thing to allow a body to um, take a look at those questions and have a second look at that decades down the road. It may be that they take a second look and say yes because of issues of punishment and justice the person should stay in, and that may be uh, the answer. And, and so I don't think we are um, eliminating the possibility of people staying in for life for these most serious crimes, but it does allow for this second look, um, and it does allow for a, a uh, just look at these sentences for people who have been in for a long, long time. And that is the Attorney General's position on the bill. Happy to answer any questions. Um, so you heard the discussion about um, uh, potentially separating out aggravated. What, what might be the, may not be a specific question that the AG considered, but. It is not a specific question the AG considered. I, I think um, my forecast of that would be that it would be something, I, I think a, something that the AG would probably consider to be a reasonable compromise and, and something that uh, would be acceptable, but I, I will take uh, a more definitive answer and bring that back to the committee. Question for David? I have a question for both David and James. In listening to the conversation, I, I think the impetus behind the bill is to look at why are we uh, continuing at, at taxpayer expense to lodge people who may no longer be competent and any kind of a threat to anyone. And I, I don't know how to fashion <coughs> or articulate what I'm running through my head right now. The state's attorneys have an overall objection on behalf of the victims, which sounds kind of legitimate to me. But would victims um, appreciate <coughs> someone that is medically rendered incapable of being a threat to society, um, is there at least wisdom there to think about whether they should still be housed at taxpayer expense? And I know um, that still raises a red flag for some victims, but if the evidence could be demonstrated by way of a petition that there's no medical reason for this individual to remain because they're no longer a threat in any fashion, um, would the victims community be more receptive to the language of the bill? So I uh, what I'd like I think that as some sort of medical furlough or home confinement furlough I actually asked DOC if that's possible for folks on life without parole there was no definitive answer I know that there's some <coughs> suggestion in the aggravated murder statute that they could be eligible for um, medical furlough um, but I think that's kind of more just, it's not end of life, it's not, it's for a specific need. Like, uh, but I think that that would be appropriate. I, I, I didn't ask the state's attorneys that specifically, but I do think that some sort of furlough, home confinement furlough is still under DOC supervision, um, could be appropriate. Um, just to pick up on where Joe's going, um, and maybe to preview my own feeling about separating out aggravated murder, isn't, isn't this something that the parole board is supposed to look at? What kind of continuing threat are you? What is your medical condition? What is your mental condition? So all by getting rid of life without parole, including for aggravated, all we're doing is saying that that person will have the ability to make a case to the parole board, which could very much be based around medical reasons um, so creating a separate category that end runs the parole board um, so that we can say that they still have life without parole, but they have this off ramp seems like a complicated way of doing what the bill I thought was originally intended to do, which is just get rid of life without parole 
and after 35 years, you have the ability to make a case, including medical, to approve. I, I understand where you're going. Yeah. Just to provide a little pushback, two of the names on James's list are uh, people who killed somebody that was familiar to me. And the community is um, very much, it's a raw nerve in the entire country. And I would envision even 30 years down the road from now, um, if they were to have the option of making that case, the community and especially the family members, who I all know, would be absolutely ballistic knowing that that's somewhere down on the horizon that they may have to re-litigate. And I can understand their frustration if that's hanging out there. I think James touched upon it, but in this particular case, this woman was very well loved in the community, uh, is very well connected with individuals that I'm very familiar with, and I know if they had that option to pursue, it signals to the family members a real uh, concern that somewhere down the road they are going to have to deal with all of this again. And that the so option, sympathetic with when them. you say that option to well, pursue if, which option? if these individuals who were on that <coughs> list had the option to be able to pursue this method. But, um, but wait, which method do you mean? Making for, a petition to from say, a medical. To, from a medical standpoint, yeah. to say that we are no longer a threat. Yeah. What that is, is a signal to the victim's families um, to have to deal with this all over again. That's why I'm on the fence with the bill altogether. There is a bill, and I'm not sure if it's in your committee or my committee on compassionate release. And that could be the vehicle to discuss that part of the you know, scenario where mm -hmm. you know we do know, I mean, uh, you know, that there are individuals who are incarcerated who are no longer capable of, of doing anything. And uh, you know, that I, that bill's never passed. I think I, I'm not sure if it's in your committee or this one. Well, no, I thought the heck was all the bills that were referred to me were sitting in the desk somewhere in the <laughs> part of the building. But I, really got them I yesterday. think that issue is more of a different subject here. And I, and I say to the victims, as long as this isn't retroactive, at this point it's pro prospective. And if you, it, it, depending upon how we do this, if we add the, you know, the aggravated is still not eligible, then the State's attorney still has the ability in the most horrific cases to uh, impose that, and that, that's what the committee chose. Uh, but I do want to hear in the future from the parole board. I think we missed something here. We haven't heard from them yet. And uh, Peggy, also the victim, said uh, Virginia's here, so I don't know if you've got um, I'm here to gather some information. I want to take it back to both my clients on this. Who are both your clients? Um, the Center for Crime and, and the National Defense Domestic Center. Yeah, so, so the, the victim, we should hear from the victims and Skyler Nash after we have. What I was thinking was we'd have a redraft by Bryn with the choices that we've laid, things that we I think we've already decided is not retroactive. That's number one. Number two, I believe that there's a few other things that she's changing. So we'll have a strike all bill, and then we'll have option one, every every crime, and then option two, to still allow aggravated murder to be um, light without parole. I just wanted to point out, if I could, so, and I think you just indirectly made this point, but that list that we saw, nobody would be affected um, by this bill, and the first Thing, if it passed this year and went into effect, it would be tw it would be what 2055 before the first person could go to the parole board. So we're talking about vast time in the future. So I, I get the idea of um, victims being concerned, and I think they will always be concerned. But 35 years is a long, long time. Um, so I, I just do that as a way of. of previewing when we talk about um, getting rid of uh, life without parole altogether or getting rid of it for aggravated. I felt this way when we went over the, the firefighter issue, whether it should be 
aggravated murder to murder a firefighter. I, I really bought Matt Valerio's argument that we were, in effect, privileging one life over another. So if we say that we're honoring the victims of aggravated murder, but somehow we're not honoring the victims of, of murder when we make this change, I, I think either we have to have a philosophical approach or not. I don't disagree, although I think the, the elements of aggravated murder yep. can make it such a heinous act that people feel that that's the only reasonable punishment for that. And I think, and I like, and because I don't have the actual numbers of people who've been convicted of aggravated murder, I too recognize many, obviously we all recognize some of those names because they're some of the most famous criminals in Vermont history. And then you think about some of the other heinous crimes, and you don't see those names on there. So, I, you know, something happened within the system when they were um, when they were convicted. This may be splitting hairs, but to me, trying to change the actual sentence structure of each of these crimes raises James's argument, in my eyes, higher than if you had passionate release statute that was separate to enable people to make that. And, and it is clear in here. Mm -hmm. um, oh God. I think it accomplishes the end result, but at least signals to victims. The argument that has to be made is one literally of they're no longer a threat to society. There's a big difference between that and knowing that somewhere down the road the parole board can just all of a sudden hop up and uh, take a look at somebody who's in the case of that particular couple that's on your list. Well, that is interesting because, well, we have a, the compassionate release bill in here because I introduced it. But the, um, the, when I was looking at that list, the, the one that's listed as aggravated, she shot two people. I mean, I know because I know it. And the ones that you're talking about are not listed. Mm -hmm. Aggravated. I mean, I don't know why she would be, right. hers would be and aggravated. We, she just shot him. We're kind of Different. talking, shot we're coming. not asking the witness Different. questions. I'm always uncomfortable. Oh, I'm sorry, David. Okay. Poor witness is sitting there saying, what should I do? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's like I'm go back to the office. And so, yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I, are there questions <laughs> for the Attorney General's office and David Sure. <clears throat> so I will say that, that the Infamous Senator Jeanette White introduced S-167, an accolade of compassionate release and parole eligibility that we should probably take up at the same time as this bill. So the next iteration, uh, when we take testimony, people please take a look at that bill. Bryn, we can um, also look at S-167. It's been around for quite a while, we should compassionate release. Um, just I'm not sure what what the definition of compassionate is, so we'll have to walk through the bill. Yeah, I, I, and I don't know I hope either. you know what it is. Uh, no, I just want us to have the conversation and figure out how we can get um, some of these people out of prison that <coughs> are there and are no longer a threat. Uh, and Frankly, I'm more concerned about some of the people that are in prison that don't belong there okay. because they're so mentally ill and we don't, and we yeah. use corrections as the default and I think that's just as unfair and incompassionate as any other Absolutely. Uh, incarceration. But Absolutely. David, thank you so much. Thank you. So thank I guess the, we're going to ask people to take a look at S-167 as well as this bill. Marshall. Yes. Did the next time we take this up, it'll be 167 in this just bill. Just throw it in our sand. Yeah, order. Yeah. Just in, yeah, keep them separate but equal. Thank you. Uh, so, Marshall Paul, Chief Juvenile Defender and Deputy Defender General, we very much support this bill. Um, as far as we're concerned, life without parole is a death sentence of a different kind, and given what we know about desistance, rehabilitation, and reoffense, it's really not an appropriate sentence in any case. Uh, and really, the reason for that is that we know that, um, to begin with, people who, th there's really two periods in uh, over the course of someone's life where they desist from offending behavior. Uh, really, first of all, when people reach about the age of, for men, when they reach about the age 25 or 26, they 
get out of that period of adolescent uh, brain development where they are very inclined to commit offenses. Um, and just naturally, without any intervention at all, people who have been had a pattern of committing offenses when they are adolescents simply stop. Similarly, people who continue or, or who commit offenses during their sort of middle age stop um, as they reach around the age of 55, 60, 65. Generally, actually, it's, uh, it lines up with when, people, uh, when people's production of testosterone starts to decline. Um, and so we, we have evidence that there are these periods of desistance that are medical. They're not, it's not based on what happens in your head, uh, you know, psychologically, it's, it's physiological. You know, it's, it's a real pattern of desistance that affects everyone. And to that end, what we know is we know that it's really impossible for anyone, for a judge, a prosecutor, for anyone to look at someone and say, this is a person who will be a danger to the rest of the world for their entire life. And the only way to remediate that danger is to remove them for their entire life. That's not a prediction that anyone is able to make accurately, period. It's not to say that there aren't people who do go on to present such a danger. It's just to say that there's no way to predict that um, with any accuracy at all from you know, 35 years prior or 50 years prior or anything like that. It's a, you know, that's a decision that's more appropriately made on the spot by a parole board saying, yes, at this moment, this person has you know, reached a point in their life where they are no longer a, a threat. Um, another piece of this puzzle is really looking, you know, when you look at how life without parole is applied across the state of Vermont, that also really speaks to the need to get rid of life without parole as a sentencing option. And that's because when you look at, you, know, you guys have seen one list of names of people who are serving life without parole. And when you think about other you know, notorious crimes that have occurred, you can see that it's really pretty arbitrary who has gotten a life without parole sentence and who hasn't. There are people that we're all familiar with, people in very recent cases, people in cases many years ago, who've committed um, crimes, offenses that are every bit as horrific as the crimes and offenses committed by the people on that list, um, but who weren't given life without parole. In fact, I know of two of the people on the list um, were both sentenced to life without parole for felony murder, where they did not actually commit a killing. Um, and in both of those cases, so felony murder is a doctrine that allows someone to be sentenced as if they committed a killing, even when they didn't, if they are someone who participated in the commission of a felony, and during the commission of that felony, someone was killed, but they were killed by someone else. So if, mm -hmm. for example, if three people break into a house to rob it, and one of the people kills uh, one of the people in the home, all three of the people who broke in could be guilty of felony murder. Two of the people I know of who are on that list were sentenced to life without parole for felony murder where they didn't commit an, any actual killing, but the people who committed the killing weren't sentenced to life without parole. Um, so That's just crazy. to talk about the arbitrariness of how That's life crazy. without parole can be applied, you know, there's at least two cases on there where really co-defendants, one co-defendant was clearly more culpable, culpable than the other and yet got the lower sentence just because of the nature of decisions that are made at charging, decisions that are made at trial, who decides to turn state's witness and give evidence against the other party. There's all kinds of factors that come into it, but at the end of the day, you're left with a very arbitrary application of life without parole. Um, similarly, um, you know, there's, uh, just to add to it, there's at least two of the people who are on that list who committed their offenses when they were under the age of 22. There's at least one person that I see on that list who I know is over the age of 70. There might be more. I didn't, I should go through and get at the ages of all of them, but there's at least one on there who's well over the age of 70. Um, in fact, I'm, I was kind of shocked to see that he was still alive when I saw his name on the list. Um, so that's really. I did, I did. My wife told me I got a call from a constituent yesterday. I said, well, did he leave his number? He said, no, but it was Henry Stromer. I said, Henry's dead. <laughs> I don't understand how he called me. So some robocall probably, but probably. I just found that to be so odd that I just read his obituary a few weeks ago. So, and, Very nice man. Yeah. So, message. Just to touch on some of the other things that have been brought up, um, you know, around the issue of deterrence, there's been 
scientific studies of this, life without parole doesn't deter anybody from anything, and it doesn't deter anybody from anything for two reasons. One is that just generally speaking, lengthy sentences don't deter people from committing crimes. There's no data to support that. There's no evidence to support that. And there's been plenty of studies because it's actually a really easy thing to study because you just look at a state where sentences have dramatically increased and you look to see whether crimes are being committed at a higher or lower rate. You account for whatever confounding factors there are in there. It's been studied up and down and right and left and nobody's ever been able to show that increasing sentences gives you any sort of a deterrent effect. Really, whenever they're able to show something creating a deterrent effect, it's always on the enforcement side. It's when they do more visible enforcement of particular crimes or when they speed up a docket so that a particular crime is going to be enforced very publicly and very quickly. Those, those are initiatives that have a deterrent effect. Checkpoints. Checkpoints, yep. But just increasing sentences doesn't have a deterrent effect. And also, they've done studies of what types of crimes do people engage in any sort of risk-benefit analysis for. And people, you know, the types of crimes that people get uh, life without parole for are not the types of crimes that people engage in any sort of risk-benefit analysis for. Um, finally, I would just say, you know, when it, well, two more issues. One is when it comes to the issue of victims. I totally understand the sensitivity around particularly those life without parole sentences that have already been imposed. Um, but there's been work done on are victims more satisfied with lengthy sentences? And if you just ask victims, are you more like, satisfied with lengthy sentences, they will say yes. Um, but when you actually study whether they are satisfied with lengthier sentences, the answer is no. So what they did is they looked at New York State parole hearings, and they divided the parole hearings. They didn't look at anybody in the middle. They just looked at people who were either serving the very, very high range of their sentencing range or the very, very low range. So people who, for whatever crime they, are, they, they committed, either got a very, very stiff sentence or a very, very light sentence. And they looked at when those people came up for parole and victims were invited to give a statement before the parole board, were victims more inclined to say, yes, parole board, you should release this guy. I feel OK that he has been rehabilitated or that he has served his time or been held accountable with the long sentences or the short sentences. And what they found is there was no difference whatsoever. Um, pretty uniformly, the vast majority of victims came in and said this person should never be released. Um, no matter whether they got a super long sentence or a super light sentence, it just simply didn't affect victim satisfaction. Um, the final thing I'll talk about is that um, we're not actually a, an outlier in considering this. Um, the Virginia governor, uh, Northam, the guy with the blackface problems. Um, He's got more problems than that right now. Sure. Well, that was the one that stuck in my mind. I was having a parade in an emergency situation. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard about that. I hadn't heard about that. Yeah, well, the, the, uh, the Charlottesville groups the, uh, are threatening to do harm during the Martin Luther King parade at the Capitol. So he uh -huh. declared an emergency at the Capitol. He's being criticized from all sides for saying you can't carry guns in the Capitol during the Martin Luther King parade. Well, here's one thing that I will say. I'll say something positive about him if that's helpful okay, to you. Um, which is that he's proposing eliminating life without parole in Virginia. Um, that's part of his uh, justice initiative for this his this upcoming Virginia legislative session. Um, and his proposal is actually interesting because he touches on both the elimination of life without parole. So his proposal is that if you serve more than 20 years of any sentence, that you're then eligible for parole. But he adds in a section that touches on the question of sort of aging prisoners. Because in addition to that, he says if you've served more than 10 years of a sentence and you're over the age of 55, then you're eligible for parole also. It's his proposal. That's not law yet or anything. That's just the administration's proposal in Virginia. There's also uh, bills to eliminate life without parole currently pending in Massachusetts and in Pennsylvania. Um, Alaska has no life without parole, um, never has. And a lot of, in fact, the vast majority of Western European countries don't have life without parole um, as an option at all. So in considering this, we're not really an outlier at all. And honestly, you know, from a practical perspective, from someone who's represented a lot of people who have gone up to the parole board, I wouldn't actually expect this bill to make a tremendous difference in many cases at all. You know, the fact is that the parole board 
does not grant parole to people who have committed very serious offenses very often. Um, they do occasionally, but they are very skeptical about it and they're very careful about it. And um, you know, it's not as if people are just marching up to the parole board and getting released for uh, who have committed heinous crimes. Mm. That's just you know, it's actually a it's a really heavy lift. When I'm counseling my clients, I counsel all my clients to expect to serve um, their maximum sentence or near their maximum sentence because you know, if they have a you know a two serve sentence, not a split sentence, because um, you know a, a, a two serve sentence where your release is going to be in the hands of the parole board, like my experience has been, that they are you know even in cases where the crimes aren't very heinous, they are very skeptical. They really need to be convinced before they release somebody, and that goes you know double or triple in the case of these types of offenses. Mm -hmm. So you know when it comes to would this result in you know, some vast number of people who commit these types of offenses being released early? The answer is probably not. Um, barring some really significant changes in how the parole board approaches things, which of course we can't predict because we're talking, like you said, 35 years down the road mm -hmm. at most. Um, but we are talking about, you know, it, this isn't some sort of automatic release or anything even, even approaching automatic release. Mm -hmm. I think that's something we all need to be reminded of. It's not something that's happening tomorrow. It's at least 35 years now. I was surprised. I knew you were good at English. I had no idea you were also good at math. Um, Added those I, numbers I, like that. You know, I, as my transcript shows, and I'm trying to make sure that it's been destroyed at the university, I didn't do well in English or math. Well, it stuck in my mind because I wrote a a novel called The Ex-President yeah. in the far-flung future of 2055 where Bill Clinton is bionically enhanced and time travel is possible. Um, so that's, that's so what we're talking mind. about. Oh, so that was 2055. Okay, I'll ask, was Monica part of the story? No. She wasn't biology enhanced. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lynn, could you join us, if you can, so we make sure we're all on the same page and we'll go here. And while we're enjoying this, I, I told many of you last night I had dinner with an ex-resident. I hadn't seen him in 20 years, and he did. It was interesting in our talk about justice reinvestment because uh, Josh had been, um, when he left 204, he told you he ran away in Morrisville because the staff member stopped in Morrisville to get gas instead of Waterbury. Um, and we talked about that, actually, and he said, you know, I. I had my hand on the door and I wasn't going to do it. And then I got out the door and I said, well, I've already done it. I'm gone. And I said, yeah, that sounds like you. Anyway, he, he did get a job for a landscaper and he broke into a house that he was working on uh, landscaping and um, he did get a sentence for it. And he, uh, what's the significance, he told me that the biggest problem he had when he got out, uh, he was stealing to get drugs. And what his biggest problem was housing. He could not get housing. And part of it was the name, his last name, because both his brothers have been convicted of serious crimes and his father's been convicted of a serious crime. So, you know, even though he had very little relationship with those three members of his family, and he lived with his grandmother, you know, before he came to home for him. And I, that struck me because of what we've been talking about in justice reinvestment and the importance of housing options for people. He had a job, and he ended up, he's an assistant manager of some food co-op up there, and, and he's ended up doing fairly well. He's got two daughters. So it was a, a nice uh, evening, but it struck me with all we've been talking about and uh, what we put in front of people getting out of jail, that housing issue, he could not get housing, he was homeless. And he gets out of jail and he's homeless. And you know, how he survived, I don't know. But he did. Um, but it, it was, it, it's interesting because it's, it's one of those key factors.